to give a quick breakdown of what the three talks are. Um, the first one is very much... Um, so you had the talk from James earlier on, here's all the stuff that you want to do when writing a parallel program. And the first talk is, um, here are some functions that you might want to call in to actually create those programs. Um, then after the first break, we're going to detail by going through the matrix multiply you've probably seen way too many times and how that actually works in practice. And then, as Jeremy said, finally we'll go on to maybe why you might want to consider OpenCL as an alternative. So the, the SDK, as you download and build it, comes in um, two main parts. The first of these is Oh, am, I, am I okay in assuming everyone's heard of GCC and... Yes, okay. Um, so, on the left is we have um, a standard GNU tool chain for, every, um, for um, compiling code and debugging it. Everything that you want to do on an individual call level. Which, I'm not going to be talking about more than just this slide because it's not very interesting because the same regards to the architecture. And then you have Adaptiva's library for um, sticking, for um, gluing together cores and allowing them to communicate. So the um, SDK comes in um, two main parts, um, which are called eHow and eLib. Elib is the um, multi-core library that you link into your programs running on on the Epiphany cores, which provides you with um, all the stuff for knowing um, what core am I, have I got a core next to me, um, can I talk between this core and another, and uh, general useful stuff that's not um, the amount to explicitly add like synchronization between cores. Whereas on um, to only that um, there's e how which because um, the epiphany cores are bare metal you need something to program them. So this is where the zinc chip with the dual core arm come arm comes in. And these, so you write a program using eHow, which goes, for example, um, have I got an epiphany chip attached to me? How many cores has it got? What memory have I got shared with it? And then I have X program, let's start running it. And um, a third part, which to an extent, you hope you don't want to use. There's a tool called eServer, which provides a useful connection for debugging your code when things go wrong. So that this runs on the ARM core, and then GDB can attach to with, uh, one of all the cores and stop them and do debugging like you would natively. Now, for those who haven't looked at getting the SDK, is um, Adaptiva provide a pre-compiled version on their um, FTP version. There's one that runs on your x86 64-bit um, Linux systems, or there's one to run on the um, board itself. The only um, major difference being apart from the architecture is that the um, X86 one comes with a ARM toolchain as well, so you don't have to go and find that from somewhere else. And for everyone else, um, at the moment, you basically have to build it yourself. Which isn't very difficult, just... It will take a while. You might have to get lunch or something. So, um, when you're uh, writing a program, the general workflow is that um, sorry, 
because Epiphany is a multi-instruction, multiple data, more specifically multiple program, multiple data, each call um, doesn't necessarily have to be doing anything at all related to anything else. So you can, depending on the type of task you want to do, you can either write, um, write a program for each specific call, or you can write one call and you can write one program and write it to a number of calls. Now, if you're building an individual um, program per call, then basically there is a step of once you compile your code, converting it to um, Motorola S records so that the E how can um, write these to the calls. Um, but in that case, you can write your program once. Right? The trade off is you either have one program which you compile once and that you have to rely on API calls for the core to work out where it is, or you can hard code that in and it should be a bit faster. Um, to do this, um, each core has a 12-bit identifier, 6 bits for its core, um, corner, its x corner, and 6 for its y. And because Epiphany has a global 4-gig shared memory, these 12 bits form the upper part of memory addresses for the core. Which, which enables um, stuff like reading and writing from one core to another. Um, if you go for the build one program and um, work on this out of runtime, there is an API eget core ID which um, will give you your core. Alternatively, at build time, you can specify these um, two defines core row and core column. And at link time, uh, the linking script provided will um, replace any references and put um, stuff where it needs to be. Um, when compiling your code, um, you have some flexibility um, over, well, you have complete flexibility, but for convenience, you can choose one of um, three linker descriptions which allows you to choose where you want code to go. So because having everything internal is fast, you can either have everything including your program and your stack and any um, built-in libraries all in the core, but at that point you better make sure everything fits in the 32K. Um, if you don't have that, if your program is larger than that, there are alternatives to put some stuff into the DRAM, knowing that it will run a lot slower. But the trade-off is you have more space available. There is a fourth option here that doesn't really fit on this sliding scale, but it's not uh, complete yet. Is there's currently in development a auto-loading um, version which at runtime um, you just can decide that these functions aren't important so they'll live in DRAM and if there's space on the core at runtime it will drag them in and, if then, and when you run out of memory if you're not using a function it will overwrite it within a more useful function which may be of interest depending on how the structure of your program is. Now, um, this part I'm essentially going to discuss what's available in each library and a brief um, example of which APIs and how why you want to use them. The, um, the first is, is providing um, mutexes for 
shared, uh, shared resources. So if you recall James's example of Hello World and whatever the other string was, and possibly having these out of order, um, you might want to use mutexes to basically wrap around and ensure that only one core can, um, act, can print stuff out at a time. Um, which is useful depending on what sort of resources you have. Um, though at that point there's a risk of deadlock. Do you try to um, a bit more about what mutexes are in general? Right, um, mutexes um, allow you to, at a high level, mark um, a specific, um, a special part of your code as I only want one. Um, for accessing this at a certain time. So that if, say, so we're using an example of printing something out, you only want one core to be printing something at a time. So you declare your intent to, I want to print something. And eventually you're told, yes, you can now print. And you do what you want to, and then say, I've finished with this resource put it back and then another core can use it. Is it blocking the game lock, the mutex lock? Mutex lock is blocking, which means there are some risks of deadlock. As per, you know, classic dining philosophy. There is alternatively a non-blocking version where you go, can I have access to this resource? And if, you're, if you can't then for increased efficiency, you may as well do something else and then try again. But then there are risks of live lock in which processes are essentially doing something, but nothing really useful to the output of your program. So while this avoids deadlock, that is still a slight issue. The one process can end up waiting on another process that's waiting yes. to hit. Yes, but it could yeah. still be doing something else. So. Um, there are also um, barriers to allow um, functions to synchronize with each other, um, course to synchronize with each other. So, for example, um, you'll see when I um, explain through the matrix multiply example, barriers are used um, for um, indicating that all cores have finished. So then the one core can go back to the host and say, I finished the matrix multiply and you can download the result now. For those who don't know what um, barriers are, is so if all um, cores are running the same program, each one might um, finish the function foo at a different time, and essentially um, no core can go further than the barrier until they all have. In terms of um, communication, a useful thing to be able to know is um, where you are on a chip. Now, um, epiphany cores have a set um, coordinate for where they live in the um, space of different cores. But the up, um, updated tools allow for work groups that can communicate. So if um, say you have, <coughs> say you, you instead of doing a, <coughs> instead of, <coughs> no that hasn't happened, <laughs> <laughs> instead of doing an extra multiply with eight cores by eight cores, you might want to do say four smaller ones of four cores by four cores. So. Um, you can group these up into um, work groups, which the setting those up will be shown in the eHow APIs because that's done on the ARM cores. But essentially, from that point, you can go like um, using e uh, core ID from cores, you could say, what is the uh, absolute core ID of? the first core in my um, work group, so that, for example, you can write something to that core. 
And then there are, use, there are conversions between, um, between relative and absolute core IDs, as well as um, tell me what my neighbor is, and the function will go, OK, I'm at the end of the work group. So the core to my right is actually wrapping around the group. Question. Oh. Um, does that always require a master? And is, is that master an epiphany core, or is that an arm core? Or? Master is just a term I've put on this slide. Okay. There is no... It's just um, for things like um, signaling that the matrix multiply is done, it's going to generally be quicker for to say, cause, uh, check if core zero says it's ready after it's waited on all the rest, rather than reading back from 64 cores and then... So it's a work group is just an arbitrary number of names. Yes, yeah. It's just more, just more for your program and convenience rather than anything in the hardware. Are all the cores complete pairs of each other, or does any of the, yes. any of the cores have any? Priority? All the cores are completely identical. Okay. Except some cores will have the edge of the chip next to them instead of another core. Um, once you have the address of the call that you want to write to, the, um, instead of calling man copy and working out the address manually, there are um, more convenient functions that will say, from this pointer relative to one call, re, re, write to this call and do the calculation in the background. Essentially, that is the same thing as going um, core ID from calls and then manually working out the address, but sometimes that might be more convenient to go, you know, what is the core of my neighbor and... Um, each core has two DMA engines which can be used for um, copying data from one place to another more quickly than um, one um, word at a time. Um, these can also be used in a blocking mode or a non-blocking mode, so you can start off a copy and do something else and have an interrupt triggered when, your, um, when the copying's finished. Can you interrupt another core? So if you do a DMA to another core, are they interrupted? Yes. yes. Um, there is there is also for um, so if you're running in a um, non-blocking mode, then eDNA wait is useful for knowing is my copying finished. If you don't have it, um, trigger an interrupt. When you say there's two engines, does that mean there can be two non-blocking outstanding at yes. one point in time? Yes. And can they be to arbitrary destinations, including yes. overlapping? I'm not sure about overlapping. Don't think it will work. <laughs> Whether the result will be of any use. Well, I suppose if you're writing from the same place. Do they stay in order until they? I'm not sure. It'd be something to try. <laughs> um, there is also um, a DMA-based version of mem copy. So if you the same port to some existing code and you have a lot of mem copies, then you can essentially replace the mem copies with eDMA copy and it's um, <coughs> you should see it run a bit faster. Um, it's worth noting that that function only uses the first DMA engine. So if you've got a non-blocking DMA copy, then if you're planning on using that and managing yourself, it's probably best using the second DNA engine for the stuff that you're controlling manually if you're doing stuff in a non-blocking mode. Presumably if you're replacing a memory copy though, it would have to be blocking. Yes, that, that is blocking. But what I mean is, if, you're already, if, that, if you're, you started in non-blocking on the first engine, then you'd have to wait for that before you do your other. Um, there are also um, hardware timers for um, measuring 
statistics of how your program is running. So going to the exam, going to James's question of which code is faster, these are your APIs. Um, you can measure a um, a bunch of different stuff. There's the total number of clock cycles and um, how long you've been waiting on the external memory for and Can, can these be enabled in kind of a debug manner so that you can turn them on and off, or would you have to add, add those? Um, you should be able to, because they're essentially just controlling registers. So you should be able to. Yes, that's probably good uses. Well, you wouldn't be able to use functions, but the, the underlying set register X to. Yes. Um, in the area of interrupts, there are at runtime you can over, you can change which um, what you want certain interrupts to do and enable and disable them, and also trigger them on other calls. So, for example, you can trigger a Sync interrupt on a particular call. So I sync the one that starts the thing in the main? I think the sync is just a useful interrupt for synchronization. Oh, okay, so it's not, not, no, not, not, not zero for one. It's a high priority um, user specified interrupt. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you can override start on the program. No, we can call it though an interrupt and make that thing reset. <coughs> yes. Okay. I suppose you could set you could set on a core if you wanted the the initialization of its interrupt. So. Um, in the area of setting up, so that's the that's basically all of the API for um, doing stuff on a particular core, with the exception of um, the stuff. Essentially, the only thing that's missing from this list is um, in a function for writing to spe uh, special registers, which really, um, so but what one about, thing that's... What about I.O. as well? Is that as in, covered as in? So if you want to do any I.O. for example, maybe you're buffering in for an external source. Um, Mind you, that's going to be in conjunction with the FPGA. Yes. Um, no, but I don't think there is. It's worth noting that um, this is the state of the API as it is. Um, over time, added team were um, adding more useful things like so the um, barriers and mutexes were, are, and work groups are part of the new release they released last, early last week, I think. <coughs> so while there are some things that um, it would be nice to have, such as um, a lightweight um, message passing thing, because the large weakness of this at the moment is there's still a lot of um, uh, managing memory yourself. So I see... Is there any hardware functionality in there for transferring messages between calls? Or is it totally reliant on it would be it would memory. be writing to it'd be writing to a known address. It would just be a useful way of instead of going writing my program I'm allocating zero x two thousand to zero x three thousand for messages. You can also send the interrupts between from one call to the other. So that yes. might be a useful signal mechanism. So if you write something to memory and you can And then you know, use it yes. So you can so yes. But to be there. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, it's a lot like shared memory programming. It basically is. But it's copying rather than sharing. Yeah. Only Normally, there's message only passing. It's only because it's, it's quicker <coughs> to, to, cop, to copy it. Um, Normally, if you're writing a message oriented yes. software, then you are copying the information. 
they are not sharing, i.e., yes. it's gone. Um, on, the, on the arm side is um, mainly just functions for um, setting up and, and you know, writing to a particular core. So um, when you start up when you start up your program you need to go through an initialization phase. Uh, this initialization takes a textual description of of the um, world around it. So say you have two 64 core chips next to each other, where are they connected to each other? And then either so this function get um, platform info uh, allows you to write will return essentially the information contained in the HDF without having to pass it yourself. So, um, for, for example, the matrix multiply on the screen over there is hard coded to um, eight, as an eight by eight matrix, but using the platform info or you could have it automatically adapt to whatever resources you have. Um, open, open and close allows you to allocate work groups for um, starting and stopping course. So if you take the approach that you write one program and then you have the system write its many calls, you can uh, you use that to specify the extent to which calls you want to write to. Related to that, you have um, so when resetting, you can either reset the entire machine or just a particular call. Sorry, what's cheap in this context? Um, I'll be honest, I don't know. But I would assume it's if you have like two devices against each other, it's in the description and I haven't got I haven't looked into how much detail into the specific old chip versus system. But I'd ima I would imagine there is some distinction in the um, description you feed it to begin with as to what is one device and what is another device. The currently um the capability of putting multiple chips together using the external mesh delivery. Yeah. So it could be that this is just resetting that chip, whereas the system is resetting all the chips. Um, yes, that's what I would expect, but being that at the moment we only have devices with one chip, I haven't had a need to. That's the next one. <laughs> yes. Um, once you've uh, written the program, um, you can either start particular calls or start an entire group. Um, in terms of, um, because some of the um, DRAM on the ARM side of the system is shared between the Epiphany and the the epiphany cores in the host, that's how these two communicate. Is there uh, are um, functions, there are equivalent versions of the read and write function to allow you to send data in and send data out. Sorry, when you allocate memory, is that from the arm side there? Um, these functions are all on the ARM side. I'm not entirely sure how that works. Because I think, am I saying obviously the heap has some memory on the com memory as well, isn't it, on the epiphany side? I'm not sure. Um, in terms of programming, um, the files that you give the API can either be either be a program for a specific core or can be programs for a group of cores pushed together. Um, so 
if you if you use the route that you have one program and one binary that gets put on all the calls, then eload group allows you to program a specific subset or all the calls in what, your um, What is program in this sense? Is that a file reference or is that a um, this it's a string referring to a file which it opens and And char pointers, I see. Um, and eload does that for a specific call. In essence, it's entirely identical to the load group, but these two variables are one. Um, the true at the end of these allows you to control whether, when a program has been written to a call, do I want that call to automatically start? to start executing or to just be in a whole state. Um, for communicating between the two, um, I think we need to allocate <coughs> allocate some memory in the in the um, shared memory and essentially use eread to read that data, so say for example, with the matrix multiply example, um, there's a point in memory in which the first call holds a value of whether the calculation is complete. While the, um, while the epiphany calls are executing, the ARM call will be continuously polling this um, memory location to see whether the value for I'm finished is done, is there. And that's the end of the first bit without any useful examples. <laughs> really not some box question. Uh, when you do the mutex initialization, yes. uh, I assume that has to happen once or does it have to happen on every call that's going to participate with the mutex? Um, the example I've seen do it on every call, but that's because it's using the same binary in all the calls. Whether it will work on just one, I'm... So, okay, I'm so sure. it's the same Sorry. mutex? Yes, it's the same mutex. They all use the same address, haven't they? They all get a mutex on something different otherwise, wouldn't they? Yeah. So how does that happen? That's just from it being the same program? Um, what do you... Because obviously you don't, the programmer doesn't tell it the, give the assign the address in which it's putting the things. You just give the, I guess how does it, what's the thing that makes it different if you loaded two different programs and you want them to communicate, uh, to share the same mutex, how would you achieve that? I guess is the other way of asking the same question. Um, you have a shared memory segment between them and if you yeah. allocate yeah. it in that section, mm -hmm. you reference that variable which we shared between the two. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have to manually create this section of the linker file, I think, to say that this area of memory should be shared between these programs and put this variable there. But it's got to be on the chip and have the high bit set in the address, or it won't, it can't be a... Well, on the very level address. Well, well, it takes only work on the chip. It should be it should, it should work on the really part of the Okay, so I thought... I've read it, please. Test set and work on the chip. I can't think of anything specific for why it was. Do you know how it's actually achieved? No, I can look at the code. <laughs> <laughs> that was what you were just discussing, I think, just a follow up question, which was if you do do it in DRAM, then given there's no cache on them, Chip. Yes, there would be a live performance. So you'd want to explicitly cache it into local memory anyway, even if it were initialized. You could also create a section in one of the core's local memory, so if you choose a core in the middle of the group that you'll want to right. then you put it there. Mm -hmm. um, and would you do would you probably do that with a sort of separate so that you say it's in the link of file? Yeah, so if you share the linker file between your different programs, they'll compile against the same one and it'll be initialized in the same place. Um, do you have any uh, feeling for how much slower the DRAM is as opposed to the local launcher? Mm -hmm. 
No, I haven't. I I'm hearing ten times from the front row. Any higher? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I guess I hope. <laughs> I don't know, but we have time in the same to check. Ten times at best. Maybe it's it's not so. I mean, you don't want to execute programs from DRAM. However, it's not so slow that it's not worth us trying to organise an overlay manager to increase the effective amount of memory you get on each core, so long as you do not end up thrashing uh, between DRAM and, and, and core memory. But part of, of, as Jane, you know, part of it is we'll have to actually learn the real chips, because we, I mean, we do a certain amount of programming, but it's pretty niche what we do, is we'll have to actually learn from these chips what are the practical ways of using them when, when those trade-offs are done. But you have got all the time as you need there to actually measure what that is. Uh, other technical question, the, the linker squids, yes. do they understand that memory no bits top bit set is alias to somewhere else in the same chip five bit set for that chip? Um, or do you have to do some fancy reservations? I make sure you don't accidentally overwrite a bit you reserve on a particular chip. The linker script has actually yes, the um, linker script has a at the start of it a list of all the addresses for all the different calls, mm -hmm. along with areas saying these addresses are reserved for DRAM. And then I believe it. I think it can decide whether it wants whether you link against things that, like its base address. Um, those that don't know the um, while each core has a a known ad address in the for the space, it also has the when the all the other bits are zero is reserved for me. So the first twelve bits being all zeros means that's my core. So whether it links, I'm not sure. The linker scripts are specific then to the particular architecture. So the, the linker script for a 4x4 16 core yeah. is different from the linker script for an 8x8 64 core. Um, and if you start combining chips, you will have to modify it to match.